Hello, this is Pete Prokilo with Fire Engineering uh, Magazine, and I'd uh, just like to welcome you to, to today's webcast, Step Up and Lead. Uh, today's webcast is sponsored by the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Enroll in their online fire and emergency response management bachelor's degree program and finish in two years. You can find them at online.uwosh.com. Dot edu slash ferm and uh, today's webcast step up and lead leadership traits will be pre presented by Frank Viscuso. Frank is is a 23 year veteran of the fire service. He's a deputy chief and tour commander in Kearney, New Jersey, a level two New Jersey fire instructor, co-creator of Fire Ops Online, and he's the author of six books including Step Up and Lead and Fireground Operational Guides with Mike Turpak. Frank travels throughout the country teaching about leadership development and team building. He's developed more than 50 standard operating procedures and has served seven years as his department's training officer. His articles appear in New Jersey Firefighter and Fire Engineering Magazine, and he's a regular blogger, one of our featured bloggers for uh, Fire Engineering's website. Uh, before we start the webcast, let's cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets that you can use. Uh, if you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We'll try to answer these questions during the live Q&A portion at the end of the webcast. Uh, if additional resources have been provided for this webcast, such as a PDF, you can download it via the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. And you can explain this slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the slide area or dragging the bottom right corner to enlarge. Uh, you can expand and arrange many of the components on your screen, so feel free to arrange them as you desire for the uh, optimal viewing experience. If you experience any technical difficulty during the webcast, just click on the help widget it has a question mark icon and addresses common technical issues. But if you still need assistance, just type your issue into the Q&A widget, and uh, one of our webcast support people will get with you to correct the problem. And for your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of the live event, and we'll send a reminder email message to everyone who registers. You'll also be able to find it on fireengineering.com. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Frank Viscuso. Thank you very much, Pete. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me on. And I really appreciate everybody who has uh, who's registered for this event and is listening in today. And, um, you know, thank you for giving me that time and uh, the gift of your time. I promise you we will make it worthwhile. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit, uh, first of all, about my my history as a writer because I am not a person – I'm not a writer who became a firefighter. You know, actually, I was a firefighter who, through the process of doing the job, learning a job, and being assigned in positions like the training officer and learning different skills, somehow became a writer. And, you know, Step Up and Lead and Step Up Your Teamwork have been the two books that have gained the most traction within the fire service specifically. They're not the only books that I have out there. There's a few. But it started with Common Valor. Um, and went into Fire Ground Operation Guides, Practice Scenarios, The Mentor, and, and Step Up and Lead, which we're here to talk about today, which is specifically Chapter 2 of Step Up and Lead Leadership Traits. But the reason I put this up there is just to give people hope. See, I graduated in the half of the class that made the top half possible. I'm not the person uh, that you thought or that I ever thought would be on calls like this, traveling the country, uh, presenting uh, about leadership, team building, and, uh, and sharing this information with people. But see, Step Up and Lead, and most of my work, was either born out of frustration or inspiration. Certainly, it'd be real easy for me to tell you, hey, I was inspired to write these books. I was inspired to write Common Valor, but I was also a bit frustrated because I felt if I didn't tell these stories, nobody else would about true stories from New Jersey firefighters. Well, the same thing with Step Up and Lead. I see a lot of things that we're doing right in the fire service, and people need to know about it. We need to spread the word. But I see a lot of things we do wrong as well. And so, uh, you know, that's pretty much how this was all born. 
Uh, today we're going to cover leadership traits, which again is module one of the full day seminar. Uh, we're not going to get into the other modules. We don't have time. But you can take a quick look at that stuff just so you know what the book covers. If you're looking for information on mentoring or delegating or critiquing, building morale, dealing with insubordination, how to even identify insubordination, uh, trust, with, which is a key in leadership. You cannot lead if you do not have trust. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that today. But report writing skills, administrative tasks, uh, conducting meetings, freelancing, uh, conducting a post-incident analysis, which is one of the greatest ways that we can learn from incidents, and uh, leading on the fire ground as well as customer service. If you're looking for information on that stuff, you know that it is available. But step up and lead can really be summed up in this one sentence or this one phrase. A leader of one can become a leader of many, but if you can't lead one, you'll never lead any. And that one is yourself. That's what we're here to talk about right now. See, my purpose, when people bring me in or ask me to come on a call like this, it's really about results. It's about trying to get better results. If you're not getting the results you want as an organization or as an individual, you're either not doing the right activity or you're not doing enough of the right activity. And one of the things I stress uh, when I speak is, is that three questions you should ask yourself daily is, what must I keep doing, what must I stop doing, and what must I start doing? And they're important because if you're doing something that works and you know it works, even if I say something today or some other speaker or someone says something that contradicts what you're doing, well, keep doing what you're doing if it works. And know that this is just another way that works for other people. A key question is what must I stop doing? Most of us keep doing the wrong activity, keep getting the wrong results, wondering why things don't get better, but yet we're not doing the stuff to make it better. But one of the key questions to ask yourself, what must I start doing? That's what I'm hoping to kind of unveil here today. Because you don't know what you don't know, just like I don't know what I don't know. So we're here to talk about things that we need to start doing that we can all become better, that we can make the fire service better. And, and consider this, for. and if you're taking notes, I, I, can, I encourage you to write this down. You cannot fix what you refuse to acknowledge. The key to becoming a, a better, more effective leader is the first acknowledging your weaknesses as well as your strengths, but acknowledging your weaknesses so you know what you have to work on. Now, I'm really happy to make this announcement before we get started, which is, uh, you know, the best part of, of the fire service for me has come into relationships. Honestly, it's the best part of life, the relationships we have. I'm honored to be friends with Paul Combs, who's just a tremendous artist. See, I'm a frustrated artist. I went to school actually to become an artist. And... <laughs> and uh, ended up becoming a fireman. Paul has done both. He's so extremely talented. He had called me a while back and said, hey, Frank, I would like to, and I, actually, he still calls me chief. I keep telling him, Paul, please call me Frank. But that's how, how respectful Paul is. But he says, chief, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take your leadership traits and feature them in a 2016 calendar. So each month, um, I can do my own interpretation of each of the traits. Now, obviously, I jumped at that. So during this presentation, I'm going to actually introduce you uh, to uh, Paul's interpretation of each of the traits that we're going to talk about. But I want to get into it now in the interest of time. I want to start talking about Leaders Teach. Leaders Teach is the acronym I use to cover the top traits associated with success in the fire service. And I know we have a lot of people that are not in the fire service on this call. They're going to, they're going to take some value away from this, too, I promise you. But the first one, L, stands for loyal or loyalty. And when I was writing about loyal, I started to think about the people that have served in our armed forces. And the question that, I, that was on my mind was, how come people only, that served in our armed forces for just a few years of their life display a lifetime of loyalty to that organization or the, or the, the branch that they served for? Why is that? I mean, I still have friends today that that have served, you know, they've been out of the service for over 20 years. Well, but as they say, once a Marine, always a Marine. And they still have, well, let's put it this way. When I had the opportunity to, to speak at Camp Pendleton and, and, uh, and some other military bases throughout the country, and I can tell you from speaking to the people that have served, and many people on the call have, I think it's because our armed forces have done a great job of instilling core values core values like the ones we're going to teach and talk about today. They talk about this. In most of the careers out there in America, or career or volunteer fire service, we don't spend enough time talking about leadership traits. 
And if, we, if we're not developing leaders deliberately, then we're not sure what we're going to get. So when talking about loyalty, consider this. How do you know a World War II vet when you see one in the street? I mean, they're usually wearing a hat or something to identify them as a veteran. And this goes really for people that have served you know, for, for, or have uh, fought in any of the wars. Well, you know, firefighters are often the same way. They usually wear something to identify them as a firefighter. They're usually easy to spot them on the street. Many times they're pillars in their community. But, you know, they're proud. They represent something that's honorable in this country, and they know it. But loyalty has to go beyond wearing a, t- a T-shirt. A firefighter has two families. You have the one at home, which is your priority, and the one at the firehouse, which is also a priority. I just got a text sent to me uh, from Bloomfield headquarters. We have a bunch of members from the Bloomfield Fire Department that are sitting down having lunch right now watching this webcast. I want to give a shout-out to them in New Jersey. But these guys understand it. I know a lot of these guys. They're, they're, you know, they're loyal to each other. Uh, they understand that, that you know, they may argue, they may disagree, they may fight like family members sometimes do, but they better love each other like a family does too, and you guys better love each other like families do because at the end of the day, we are all we have. Because when we're inside of that building doing the things that we need to do, we have to rely on each other. Loyalty also breeds pride in your job. You know, here's a firefighter. It's not a great photo, and I apologize for that, but this is Kevin Becker from the Kearney Fire Department in New Jersey. I've known Kevin now for about 10 years, and and since I have known Kevin, every day he arrives at work, his shift relieves our shift. He arrives at work a half hour to an hour early. He jumps on top of that apparatus. He checks the hydrant tools. He goes through the apparatus to make sure everything's there. Why? Because Kevin has ownership mentality compared to entitlement mentality, which, in my opinion, is the biggest problem we have in society today. Kevin has ownership mentality. In his mind, he owns that apparatus. He owns the equipment on it. He wants to know everything about it. And he's a great example to show other people when we're trying to say, hey, this is the right way to do things. See, now, when you have people in your organization that are great examples, bring attention to it. It's okay to catch somebody doing the right thing. But when you praise, praise in public. But let other people hear it too. Why? Because it's going to help you build your culture. Cultures you have to build by design. You know, and I love having fun at the firehouse. Anybody that knows me will tell you that. I love when I hear the members laugh. I love when they're having a good time. But we go out there and we we earn those good times by working hard because a fraternity-like atmosphere, that could be trouble. Have fun, but don't haze. Don't badmouth each other. Remember this. The strength of your team can be measured by your level of loyalty towards each other. And Paul's interpretation of loyalty is great. You know, loyalty, obviously, loyal people are valued in our society. But here's a picture of an officer that, and a firefighter speaking to him, going, hey, I'm 100% loyal to this department. I would never undermine your authority behind your back. And on the opposite side, it's that same firefighter saying, until I am behind your back. But that's an example of what we're talking about. See, suggestions for improvement on loyalty would be simple. Refrain from discussing problems of the department with outsiders. Keep things in-house. Never talk about seniors or superior officers unfavorably in front of your subordinates or behind their back, as in the photo, and carry out every task to the best of your ability and do so enthusiastically. Understand we are one team, one team with one mission. The next trait I want to talk about is educated. That's our job. It's our job to go out there and make good decisions, and you can't do that without a great education. And after the academy, the problem is, you know, and, and I know this is nationwide from my conversations with many people, but, but after the, the academy, that's like the most structured, formal training that we'll have. And after that, most of the training we have is going to remain in-house, what we do for our own organization. That's why we need to be more aggressive. That's why we can't afford to train for failure. That's why we have to understand that complacency is our greatest enemy. And I think there's a coma of complacency in society in general. We have to get out of that mindset, and we have to understand that self-education is essential for every profession. You hear the word situational awareness. Well, you know what? The only ways that you can create situational awareness, when you think about it, is through education and preparation. At the beginning of this webcast, Pete talked about the University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh. They have a fire and emergency response management bachelor's degree program, a two-year program. That's a perfect example of what we would need to do as firefighters to get out there and, and put, invest in ourselves because that's the most 
important investment you can ever make in life. And I'll tell you quickly about the four best ways to learn, you know, outside of an, an education, a formal education like that. I'm just talking about in the firehouse what are the, or, or, or just in your daily activity, what are the best ways to learn? Well, one is books and videos. I'm going to categorize that together. And no, I'm not talking about Facebook. I'm talking about good, solid, fire t tactical textbooks, educational leadership books. They don't have to be, you know, ones that are put out by fire engineering or by Penwell, but those are the best books for our industry, you know, but, but good, solid books that can help you educate yourself and learn what you don't know. There's also seminars and events, events like the one you're on today. But it's not just attending a seminar that's going to help you. It's more so about about the people you'll meet, the education that you can get, the, the networking aspect of it, the fact that you can leave there uh, meeting other people that have maybe faced and, and, and overcome some of the challenges that you're uh, currently encountering and you can develop a relationship with them. I mean, that's what I did when I was in the training office. How about this? On a job training or drills, are you doing enough of that? Are you spending more time on the fire ground than you are on the training ground? If so, that's a problem. Unless you are the busiest department in the country, of course. But four is real-world incidents. The problem with learning in the real world at real-world incidents is that's a tough place to get uh, a hard education. That's why that little asterisk is there next to it, because we can turn into, into a post-incident analysis and, and learn the right way that we can learn from mistakes we made as well as, as enforce things that we did correct. Now, I just want to leave you with this thought uh, as we're talking about education. In our industry, I personally believe, and I think a lot of people agree with me, that education is not the best teacher. I'm sorry, forgive me. Experience is not the best teacher when it comes to education. What is the best teacher is other people's experience. So many people have come before us. So many people have learned the best or better ways to do things. So many people have made mistakes. People have been injured. People have been killed. For us not to take the time to learn from that so we can be better is, is as much of a tragedy as the tragedy itself. So consider these four great ways to learn in the fire service. And again, Paul Combs nails this one with, you know, uh, you know, it, it's a shame what happens. I've heard comments like, hey, you can't throw a book at a fire and put it out. No, you can't. But you certainly aren't going to be a better firefighter if you don't have the education from a, a person like Vincent Dunn. Vincent Dunn said it's better to be lucky rather than smart. But if you're smart, you have a better chance of being lucky. So here's a firefighter reading a book on modern-day construction for the fire service and another one saying, why are you always reading, always learning something new? Do you have any idea how that makes the rest of us look? Well, meanwhile, on TV, they're talking about firefighters being injured during a collapse. Listen, suggestions for improvement. Learn something new every day. Ask questions. Know your policies, procedures, and SOPs. Don't let negative people distract you. I stay away from negative people. You know why? They have a problem for every solution. And never stop improving you because the only person you should be competing with every day is the person you were yesterday. Let's move to the third one, adaptable. You know, years ago, I say this, years ago we fought fires. When I became a firefighter, that's what we did. We fought fires. But today, what do we do? It's more like asking the question, what don't we do? You know, the, the job description has changed uh, dramatically. You know, we're doing more, and in many instances, we're doing more with less. But I want to talk quickly about how I became the training officer. I mentioned it a little bit earlier because I know we have a lot of training officers on the line right now, and, and some of you maybe have, have requested to be in that position. You know, when our training officer was, uh, was getting promoted and, and stepping out of the office, he was looking for someone to replace him and was going around the, our whole organization asking, would you like to be the training officer? Are you interested in being, becoming a training officer? Are you? It, it was considered to be an undesirable job, so everybody said no. When he got to me, I remember exactly where I was standing like it happened yesterday at Station 3 in front of one of the, en uh, the engines. The apparatus door was open. I'm right in the middle. He walks up and he says, hey, you know what? You know, we're looking for a new training officer. Are you interested in becoming the next training officer? And I said, what does a training officer do? Because I just didn't know. And when he went through the list of things that the training officer did, I said, well, you know, I don't think it's for me, but thanks for asking. The next day I show up for work, I go, uh, start get ready the chief calls me up to his office asked me to sit down and says congratulations i said for what he said you're our new training officer i said me why me he said you showed the most interest that's a true story 
I was incredibly intimidated. What I did not realize was how I was lacking in writing and presentation skills. Writing certainly was not my strong point. And, and let me just clarify this by letting you know this. My, my editor makes me a much gooder writer. It is not my strong point. But yet I still managed to write a few books. Presentations and live presentations, speaking in public, was not my strong point. But today that's what I do. But it was from skills that I learned being a training officer. I was forced to adapt. I was able to create between now it's about 65 SOPs for our organization. You know how you create an SOP? Here's how you write an SOP. You go to Phoenix Online. You download theirs. You change the name Phoenix to the name of your department. You send it down. You just wrote your first SOP. And I'm, and I'm, I'm joking, but in a way I'm really not. See, what happens is we are in an industry where we share information with each other unlike most industries where it's cutthroat and they don't want you to know what their special sauce is. Here we do. Here we share information. I was able to acquire more than a dozen buildings that we can actually go in and tear up, cut roofs, do search drills, smoke them out, stretch lines, do full, I mean, really great training, take out windows, everything. Uh, training that we really didn't get to do since the academy. Uh, I was able to acquire more than $3 million in grant money and I started writing. And um, actually, I'm a deputy chief today because what I learned as the training officer. I go around the country as a consultant and doing some keynotes. Why? Because what I learned as a training officer, I don't say this to impress anyone on this webcast. I say it to impress upon you that it all resulted from a position I didn't want. You already adapt also. Is it by choice, though? See, if you're being asked to do more, maybe there's a reason. Maybe it's because you're talented. Maybe it's because you're determined. Maybe it's because you've shown that you're a reliable person. Maybe there's more to it. Richard Branson, though, he said this, every success story is a tale of constant adaption, revision, and change. Paul's interpretation. It's a great one. Person in the, if you can't read that, the person in the uh, middle is saying, it's the same dragon or call we respond to. Uh, all the time, kid. It's going to be a false alarm. There's no need for all that gear. Now, you cannot adapt if you don't have the right tools. And in relation to that cartoon, I think the only time we can ever really re or really classify anything as a routine call is long after that call is is over. That's the only time. You know, I've I've met with plenty of firefighters who have responded to routine calls and nearly lost their lives. Well, again, suggestions for improvement. Never stop educating yourself. Leaders are readers. Welcome challenges. The only time you grow is when you step outside of your comfort zone. And don't get ton of tunnel vision. Learn to think outside the box. I like telling a story that of what happened back in 1995. Uh, we do a lot of vehicle extrications. We have a lot of entrapments. And our members responded to... Um, to a young couple that was, you know, a young man, 21, 22 years old. They were driving through Kearney. He lost control of the car, spun around, uh, you know, 2 or 3 in the morning. He spun around the car on the passenger side, wrapped around a telephone pole like a horseshoe. When our members arrived, he was across the street. He was dazed and confused. There was a girl in the front, in the uh, passenger side against the pole. She was banged up pretty bad. She was in pain and agony, screaming, short dress on. Her femur was popping through her leg. I mean, she was in bad shape. Our members went to work, started to make some cuts, and the tools jammed. And we had been having a problem with the tools back then. I still remember when they told us, don't train with them, because they were trying to get enough money to get these tools fixed because they were so expensive. Uh, but use them at, at an incident because they would jam on us frequently, but we would able, be able to reboot the system, and about six to eight minutes later, they'd work. Well, it didn't happen this time. They didn't work. And to the credit of the deputy that was in control, the incident commander of the incident, he had called for another company from a neighboring department to come so they can uh, have their tools handy, and they arrived on scene at the right time. But we were making no progress on the car, and when the members aren't making progress on the car, and you were talking about the golden hour and signs of shock are starting to set in. The incident commander pulled everybody together and said, hey, listen up. What we're doing isn't working. We need another plan. That's what the person said. But here's, what, here's the words that are really being said there. Hey, my best thinking isn't getting this job done. Who's got a better idea? And there's something that you have to respect about a person that can say that at the right time. 
And so the officers got together, put their heads together, and one of the firefighters said, hey, you know what, if we could just take out that pole, I'm working it from the other side, we can get her out quickly. But we couldn't do that. You know, the members can't do that. You have power lines on, on top of the pole. But it prompted the next suggestion to where one of the officers said, hey, there's enough of us right here right now that we can pick up that car and move it. The deputy said, let's get on it. Everybody got around the car. They counted the three. They picked up the car. They moved it aside. And within about a minute, that girl was out and, and on her way to the hospital. The moral of the story could be summed up with this thought. The best ideas have to win. The best ideas have to win. See, now, people that are leaders on this call, I want you to consider the fact that the best ideas may not always be yours. We have to humble ourselves up to, uh, enough to think, hey, maybe a best idea is going to come from somewhere else. And I'm certainly not saying that as a fire service we should start going to incidents and take a poll. Don't misinterpret this message. The idea is to train enough so we know what the best ideas are. We implement the best ideas. That's what SOPs are. SOPs are the one best way you have found to do a specific task. And then we can go out there and execute. The next one I want to talk about is determination. To be determined means you will not stop, quit, or slow down until you've achieved your goal. The question I like to ask a lot is this. Is it possible, in our industry, in the fire service, is it possible to be too determined? And when we're talking about risk assessment, when we're talking about, about getting tunnel vision, when we're talking about situational awareness, I think the answer is yes. Proper risk assessment has to go without saying. I think every fire department in the country should have this or a version of this posted somewhere on their walls. We risk a lot to save savable lives. We risk little to save savable property. We risk nothing to save lives and property already lost. Why do I say that? Because this is a great basic, minimum, but essential risk assessment. The question is, what are we saving? What are we saving? When we talk about determination, listen, a good leader has vision, sees the end goal, and communicates, but a great leader follows through. A great leader is going to say, hey, give us challenges. We will face it. We will overcome it. Why? Because they're problem solvers. And if I could, if I could sum up this whole class, you know, what is a leader? A leader is a problem solver. I want to give you four quick steps. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to write these down. It's just going to be four words. Leadership 101 is what this is. Leadership 101 comes down to four steps. One is identify. Two is assemble. Three is develop. And four is solve. One, identify. You, want, you know, leaders identify problems. Let's just speak about that for just one moment. One of the biggest, most valuable assets that I see in newly appointed officers is their ability to identify the problem. Because you can't fix what you can't acknowledge. One, identify the problem. Two, assemble. What does that mean? Assemble a team, a, a group of people for the mission that you want to implement to do number three, which is develop that solution, and number four, which is solve the problem. And if there was a fifth step, by the way, that fifth step would be repeat. Identify, assemble, develop, solve, and repeat. I want to give you some suggestions for improvement. And, of course, you know, Paul, this is the, the cover for the, for the catalog, or I'm sorry, the calendar for 2016. And... You know, it says it all. It says it all, and it's a throwback to that whole um, little engine that could. Even in my son's uh, wall, I have three boys. Uh, on my, one of my son's walls up in his room has the sign, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Well, I like this even better. I know I will. I know I will. I know I will. See, suggestions for improvement come down to two words, follow through. Follow through on the things you say you're going to do. And I love the mentality of we'll either find a way or we will make one. The next one is enthusiastic. Do you remember what it was like when you first became a firefighter? See, there's a lot of people on this call that have been in the service for me now 24 years. How many of you dreamed of becoming a firefighter when you were young? You know, and it's easy to be excited when you start something new, isn't it? Anytime, hey, you know what, you just got a new job, you're, you became a volunteer, whatever it may be, it's easy to be excited about it. But life presents challenges and enthusiasm often fades. Well, it's your responsibility and my responsibility to not let our personal challenges affect our attitudes. You know, in most polls in America, for the career firefighters 
on this call. In most polls in America, we are ranked number one in career satisfaction. Firefighting is considered the greatest job on earth by many people that do it. That being said, the question I have for you on a call is, how come some of the most miserable complainers I've ever heard in my life are in the fire service? Right now, my friends in Bloomfield are all looking at each other and laughing, I'm sure. What, see, we allow that attitude in our culture. And it's funny sometimes to sit here and complain about things, but are you complaining or are you, are you identifying a problem and coming up with a solution because you're a problem solver? Because the world's full of problem finders. We have to understand that it's okay for us to make it cool about being enthusiastic about this job. You know, in the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, very first chapter, they talk about how any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, and most fools do. And in that book, Dale Carnegie says, misery loves company. You know, temper, if 10% of the people in your organization are positive and 10% are negative, the question becomes, who's going to win over the other 80 percenters? I want to propose to you that the negative people have the advantage. Why? There seems to be less of them, but they're way more committed to their cause. You know, I have a friend who, you know, is pretty, pretty negative. And one day I had a conversation with him, and I said, how come you're never happy? And he says, I'm happy. I said, well, can you notify your face? Smile sometime. Make it act like you're happy. You know, because, because listen, attitudes are contagious. You want to make sure yours is worth catching, especially if you're in a leadership role. You know, there's a byproduct of high morale. Customers will receive better service. Accidents and injuries decrease. Grievances are minimized. There's better attendance, a more disciplined team. And listen to this one. People enjoy coming to work. Enthusiasm is going to take you further than talent or skill ever will. But, you know, that being said, life happens, right? I mean, one of my friends once said, you're either in a crisis, just got out of a crisis, or heading towards a crisis. In my life, I found that to be true. But that being said, you, you may have a question, you know, how do I handle challenges or concerns or anger or frustration? Here's the best tip I can give you. Negative up, positive down. Vent to your level and above. If you're a captain on this call and you need to vent, because we all need to vent, we're human beings, speak to another captain. It doesn't even have to be in your organization. I'm lucky enough to have relationships with, with people like uh, Anthony Avillo and Mike Turpak where I can call these guys up who have had you know, a tremendous amount of years of experience in the fire service and say, hey, listen, here's what I'm dealing with right now. How did you guys handle this when you had a situation like this? My brother being a deputy chief, real easy to call and talk to him. You know, vent to your level and above. Now, Paul's interpretation of this, uh, you know, this one's out there for all the training officers, all the enthusiastic firefighters out there. Sometimes you feel like you're the minority. Well, I've got to tell you something. Understand what the mission is of the fire service. This is our mission, to reduce the loss of life and property and to protect the weak. And if there was a third one in there, the mission would be to provide the best service possible. And there should be something that we should be really excited about with doing that because we're serving people. There's no greater profession out there. You know, we're meeting people at the worst moments of their life, but guess what? You're showing up to try to make it better. And you have to be enthusiastic about the job you're doing so you can be in the right frame of mind, so you can be trained properly, so you can show up and do what you're there to do, career or volunteer. The next one is reliable. See, reliability, like all these traits, it can't be fake. You don't turn it on and turn it off. A reliable parent is often a reliable employee. If you fail to meet deadlines in your personal life, you're going to tend to fail to meet deadlines in your professional life. You know, you may have a reliable person as an example. In society, we're morally bankrupt sometimes when it comes to this particular trait. But never in my life. I was lucky enough that, you know, my father is the most reliable person that I've ever known. And anybody that knows my father would know him as a reliable person, as an honest, trustworthy, reliable person. So it's easy for me to really understand the value of this trait. He was there for us any time we needed him. I don't remember a wrestling match, a crew meet, anything that I've ever competed with in my life that my father wasn't there in the front row cheering on. Becoming a, he's still on the Board of Education in Kearney. He's a retired firefighter. He served in the Navy. And I talk about him passionately because of the example that he set. You know what? You may not have a strong father figure in your life. And you may not even have a strong father figure or example of somebody at work. But I want you to know something. That doesn't mean 
that you shouldn't try to become that example for somebody else. And how do you become that example? It's by what you do every single day. See, people judge you by your actions. They don't judge you by your intentions. And the most of the time that we spend in the fire service, you know, we spend it in the firehouse or on the training ground. So don't cut corners around the firehouse because if you can't be relied on to take the garbage out or wash the apparatus or maintain your equipment or complete your reports on time in an unhostile, soft environment like the fire station, how do you expect to be considered reliable in a hostile or the hard environment like the fire ground? You'll develop your reputation every day by your daily habits. Self-explanatory with this cartoon. I actually love this cartoon because it does resemble my father, and I like that. But suggestions for improvement. Develop your skills, show initiative, tackle new assignments, and become one of your department's go-to firefighters. And then take action and make it obvious. That's the key. Make it obvious that you're one of your department's go-to firefighters because as deputy chief and as a tour commander, I can tell you, I know who my go-to members are. And any person in a leadership position on this call knows who their go-to members are. Become one of those people. The next one is selfless. Why did you choose to become a firefighter? Why did you choose? See, th these are six of the top reasons why people work. For time, money, security, recognition, to belong to a team, or to make a difference. A lot of times I speak to people in the volunteer uh, organizations that ask me about retention. We're having a hard time with retention. You know why you're having a hard time retention? Because you're not focusing on those bottom three. You're not focusing on recognition. You're not focusing on making that person believe that they now belong to a team and making them understand the difference that they're making in society. Because people don't volunteer for time, money, or security. They volunteer for recognition to belong to a team or to make a difference. And I'm sure there's other reasons. Don't get me wrong. But as a leader of an organization, you want to make sure people feel like they belong to a team because if they show up to a drill and nobody talks to them and you have the senior members that only show up at fires, occasionally show up at a drill, standing there not teaching anybody anything, you got the junior members standing there saying, I wish somebody would teach us something, and then they get on their phone and they start texting because no one's talking to them. And then the senior members are saying, look at them. All they do is look on their phones. Well, what are you doing? to talk to them. Tiger Schmittendorf has a great class on this, if anybody's interested, where he talks about the Xbox generation and how to communicate with each other and how to, how to understand that we may come from different backgrounds, but we can connect. Listen, I'm not saying Rex Ryan is a, is a tremendous leader. I don't know anything about the guy, but I'm going to tell you this. Everyone knows firefighting is a selfless job. Let's go beyond the obvious. True leaders are selfless in all areas. They care about helping others develop confidence and achieving success. They care about the team. They don't care who gets the credit. In 2010, Rex Ryan, and this is when he was coaching the Jets, and the Jets almost made the Super Bowl, he told his players, anytime you give an interview, you have to mention at least two players and one coach. He wanted them to be less selfish and more selfless. How about Drew Brees when he was about to break Dan Marino's single-season passer record? Everybody, every person I interviewed and wanted to talk about Drew Brees, how amazing you are, and I happen to agree. I love the guy. I think he's amazing. I'm a big fan of him. But I'm a big fan of him because of reasons like this. He would always say, hey, look, I'm not about to break any record. All I'm doing is throwing the ball down the field or someone else at the other end catching it. And there's a group of people standing in between me and the other team preventing them from making roadkill out of me. Once a week, Drew Brees takes his offensive lineman out for dinner. I can't imagine what that bill is, but I'm sure the guy can afford it. See, the paradox of leadership is this. To be an important leader, you have to consider yourself to be the least important person on the team. The most recent example that I know in sports anyway is the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team. 2015 World Cup champions. What a great season. They started out. They didn't look like they were going to make it out of the first round. They end up winning it all, and in the final match, Carly Lloyd scores a hat trick, including one of the most spectacular goals I've ever seen in my life. And listen, I'm from Kearney, New Jersey, Soccer Town, USA. You know, I'm friends with John Harkes and Tony Miola. I've seen tremendous goals in my life, but I've got to tell you, for those of you that watch Carly Lloyd score from half field, just to have the courage to take that shot's amazing. But it was just incredible. What was great about that game was that late in the game when Abby Wombat, who has been the, the, the team captain for many years leading up to this, 
Um, Carly Lloyd was the captain on the field at the time. When Abby came in to replace another player, not even Carly, she came in to replace another player, Carly Lloyd ran up, took the armband, the captain's armband off of her arm and put it on Abby's. Why? Because what she said later was, Abby has always been my captain and always will be. Well, if you look at the team photos in the locker room afterwards, Abby's not wearing that armband. Carly's not wearing that armband. Christy Rampone is. Why? Because Abby took the armband off of her arm. She put it on Christy Rampone, and she said, Christy's always been my captain and always will be. You see, teams fail when one person wants to take all the credit. And we know that from, you know, the very first U.S. Olympic dream team were tremendous. They dominated the competition. They were expected to dominate the competition. But several years later, another dream team took the field, and they could hardly even win a game. Why? Because they were about themselves. They weren't about the team. The lane theory is a theory that really encompasses the whole selfless comp uh, or, uh, or trait. And the lane theory is this. Find out what people are good at, put them in their lane, and get out of the way. You see, everybody on your team has their own talent, skills, and ability. And what you want to do if you're in a leadership role is identify what people are good at, put them to work. Put them in that lane and get out of the way. Lee Cockrell from, from Disney has a great book out there called Creating Magic. And in that book, on page 38, he wrote, Every worker has different motivations, priorities, and dreams. Workers hail from different backgrounds and different neighborhoods. To make them feel special, you have to get to know every person. How do you do that? Learn about your employees' past work experiences, their aspirations, their skills, their talents, their short- and long-term goals. Get to know about their personal interests and their families as well. They'll light up when you remember seemingly minor facts about their lives. Now take it one step further. Use that information to find ways to maximize their abilities and help them recognize their goals and ambitions. Albert Einstein said this, everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it'll live its whole life believing that it's stupid. And I know for a fact that Einstein said that because I read it on the Internet. And I hope you know I'm joking on that. Suggestions for improvement. See, now Paul took a different direction with this one, and I love that direction. You may have seen this uh, cartoon before. But see, suggestions for improvement when it comes to selfless is think more about others, less about yourself. Avoid using your position for personal gain at the expense of others and give credit where credit's due. You see, great leaders do not set themselves above their followers in any areas except the areas of caring responsibilities. Next one's tough. The definition of toughness to be strong and resilient, able to withstand adverse conditions, or the ability to endure great strain without breaking, mentally or physically. Listen, everybody knows what we do in the fire service is not an easy job. I mean, we're considered number one in career satisfaction. We're also considered to be number one or two in stress. There's nothing easy about what we do. And I love the mentality of we want the hardest job on the fire ground. We want it every time. I love that mentality. But sometimes being tough is, is understanding that, we have a job to do, and it's to take care of our team, take care of each, of each other. You know, tough is not jumping into the fire after it's out, pulling ceilings and taking your tank off. That's just stupid. When carcinogens are the highest, if you didn't check the CO levels before you do something like that, it's just, in my opinion, it's reckless. It, it's, it's ridiculous. We have to look after each other. We have to t but sometimes you have to be the tough person to say, hey, everybody, put your tanks on. I've had a, a personal situation where I, I told one of our people to put their tax on, and, and I got the reaction you would expect from a 14- from a or 15-year-old with the, you know, come on, you know, we're exhausted. I can't even raise my arms. If you can't raise your arms, go into rehab. We'll get somebody else to do it. But the person said to me, no, we can do it. We just want to take our tax off. And I said, I want you on air when you're pulling ceilings. Walked away from me a little bit upset, so I called him back, and I said, hey, how old's your daughter? And he told me 13. I said, well, my goal is to make sure that you're there to dance with your daughter at her wedding. Put your tank on. You know, when people understand that you're doing things for the right reasons, because you have their health and their best interest in mind, they're going to respect you for it. 
You have to be willing to make tough decisions sometimes. You have to be a leader first and a buddy second. And insubordination absolutely has to be addressed. And if you have an, a, a trouble with insubordination, dealing with a problem person, I do want to encourage you to, uh, to, if you do have a copy of Step Up and Lead, pick up the book, read Chapter 3, where we talk about the three U's, unaware, unable, or unwilling. It's going to help you identify when a person is insubordinate or when they just may be unaware or unable, because insubordination is really, in my opinion, comes down to when a person's unwilling, which is boldly resisting authority or having a defiant attitude. And we don't have time to get into all of that right now, but understand this. Fixing bad habits takes courage. Your organization has policies, rules, regulations, just like mine does, and it's a leader's job to enforce them. Because if you pick and choose which ones you're going to enforce, well, then everybody else thinks they can do that as well. Do some of them need to be changed? I guarantee you some of your policies, some of your SOPs especially need to be changed. We're in the process of changing ours again, and this will be the third revision of them. Now, that being said, when things need to be changed, go through the proper channels to change them. But policies are written for a reason. Many times every policy out there has one person's name on it, and I believe that we need to deal with the problem person instead of just sending a blanket policy out there to cover everybody. However, policies will still be written and still need to be followed. Now, seriously, who doesn't love a purple bunny? This is Paul's interpretation, and I really do like it because you're never going to be the person that you can become if pressure, tension, and discipline are taken out of your life. You know, I've heard a term a long time ago, I use it as a subtitle in the mentor, which is the dream, the struggle, and the prize. Every success story I've ever known, and I'm sure you could say the same, has at least three components, the dream, the struggle, and then the prize. And the difference between it being a success story and a failure is what happens during that struggle. Did the person or the team overcome it or succumb to it? See, every obstacle you overcome makes you a better, stronger, tougher, more capable version of yourself. That's what this cartoon to me represents. Don't wait for everything to be perfect. Suggestions for improvement are make decisions and take action. Learn to love to fight more than you love winning and stay mentally and physically fit. You know, Good friends of mine, Doug and Dan, I'm sure everybody would, uh, on the squad would know of Doug Mitchell and Dan Shaw. They wrote 25 to Survive, tremendous book, highly recommend it, highly recommend their class if you get a chance. They talk about industrial athletes and how we are as firefighters, industrial athletes, how you have to throw 50, 60, 70 pounds of gear on at 3 o'clock in the morning and run out and go full speed for a half hour or longer. That's the kind of toughness we're talking about when we talk about physical toughness. You have to be prepared for that, and you have to be prepared mentally as well. The next one is empathetic. I, this, is in my, this is my favorite definition of the word empathy, which is to accurately see things through another person's perspective. We love our families. We love our brothers and sisters, but a true leader is going to also love the public. Why? Because we're servants. It was back in early 95, we became EMTs. I'm talking 21 years ago. We became EMTs on my department. And most of us, including myself, did not want to be an EMT. The biggest reason why I didn't want to be an EMT is because everybody said they didn't want to be EMTs, and I just figured we don't want to be EMTs. I think it's good for our profession, real good for our profession. But back then, I didn't understand it. But now we had gone through our EMT training. We had not even received our cards yet when we responded to a call of an attempted suicide. It was in an apartment complex, and as we're walking to the door, uh, me and another firefighter, Henry McGee, um, a police officer stops us on the way in and says, be careful, she's carrying. Now, I'm thinking, well, she's got a gun. Why aren't you in there? Well, Henry turns to me, being a young firefighter, he turns to me and he says, one word, AIDS. Now, I don't, I don't want to for any second sound like I, I don't have compassion for people that deal with health, health issues. I've dealt with my own health issues. My family, we've had health issues. So I understand that. And matter of fact, I'll fast forward and let you know that I have friends that are HIV positive that are healthier than I am. It's not about that. It's the fact that this is 1995. When we didn't know anything about it, when we asked our instructors in the class, how do you transmit AIDS, they really weren't 100% sure. It's equivalent to what Ebola was back in October of 2014 when everybody thought, the whole world was going to catch and die, catch uh, the Ebola virus and die from it. You know, 
my wife was terrified about it. She called me up wanting to cancel a trip to Disney because of everything they were saying on the news and what some people were telling her that didn't know anything about the virus. I said, honey, let me put this in perspective for you. Right now in our country, two people have Ebola. Four people married Larry King. You're at greater risk of marrying Larry King than contracting Ebola. Let's put it in perspective. We need to train for it in the fire service? Absolutely. But as a society, we don't need to panic. Well, this is back in a time when, as a society, there was a little bit of panic. So when I walked into this apartment complex, and, and by the way, we had a bad problem with heroin back then, and there was a bad problem in New Jersey and throughout the country with heroin right now. It's a problem that I hope we can find an answer to. But I believe that played a factor in this particular situation. We walked in to the um, apartment. I walked into the bathroom, and in the bathroom, the blood was everywhere. I mean, it just covered everything. And, and there was a razor blade on the sink, and there were footprints going to the back bedroom. And in the back, there was a woman sitting with her back to us on the edge of her bed. She had her head down, and she had about two or three cuts on each arm, just like in that photo that she made. Now, in retrospect... Here was a girl that was not trying to commit suicide. Here was a girl that was calling for help. I didn't recognize that. And I paused at the door, and I was really nervous. In my mind, I'm thinking, look, I don't really know what this girl has. I just know I don't want it. And I'm ashamed to tell you that. But that's what was going on in my mind. But Henry McGee didn't pause for a second. He walks up. He kneels down in front of her. He has his gloves on, and, and he lifts. I remember him touching her chin and lifting her chin so they could make eye contact. And he says to her, Honey, why are you doing this to yourself? And I realized at that moment that he knows her. And so I snap out of it, and I go, and I help him wrap her up, and the ambulance comes. We didn't transport. The ambulance came, and they took her and transported her, and we went back to the engine. And I said to Henry, I said, I'm sorry I froze back there, but I didn't know you knew her. And Henry said, I don't know her, but she's somebody's daughter. And I have to tell you, that made an impact on me. It made an impact impact on me because at that moment I realized that I failed at what I was there for and I was disgusted with myself and I've learned from it and it's never happened again because you know what we can learn from our mistakes you can learn from your mistakes of the past stop dwelling on them get over them go out and become a better version of yourself you know we have to be aware of what's happening in the lives of each other too we have to take care of our own and understand that today's fire service leaders are more than just tactical strategists. We're marriage counselors. We're therapists. We're advisors. Be aware of what's happening. If behavioral changes happen in the people around you, bring them aside. Talk to them. Ask questions. Make sure everything's okay with them. You know, suggest the employee's assistance program or some form of counseling if we have it. But nine out of ten times, a person just wants to know that other people care about them. And that's the starting point, I understand. But they need to know that. And we are a team, and we do need to care about each other. Paul sums it up this way, and I love this. Who needs patient compassion with empathy? I bought an app for that. We live in a high-tech world, but we are a high-touch profession. So the suggestion for improvement is real simple. Treat people the way you would want to be treated. It's that simple. The next one is assertive. This is a core communication skill. It could be summed up in that simple, simple words like command presence, words like posture. What is assertiveness? Listen, being assertive means you express yourself effectively and stand up for your point of view, but while also respecting the rights and beliefs of others. And we live in a society that has so much hatred for the opposing point of view. Millions of people don't even want to hear the other side of you. What they want to hear and what they watch are news channels that align with their own personal beliefs, and that's fine. But those channels are also going to teach you to hate anyone that thinks differently. My advice is to, you know, anybody and to a team is that we should agree to disagree. Show respect for the opposing point of view. Let Fox and MSNBC fight it out. I don't have time for that stuff. Paul sums it up real good. And this one's spot on. See, there's two ways to fail. To do without ever thinking and to think without ever doing. Suggestions for improvement. Stop trying to please everybody because it's impossible. You can't do it. Think about your options and then be self-assured when you make a decision. Be firm, but remember that third trait, to be adaptable when you need to be. 
the next one, one of my favorite ones to talk about, is courage. Courage is defined as the ability to do something that frightens one or to show strength in the face of pain or grief. Every Step Up and Lead seminar, at the end of it, I usually take a few minutes and ask people if they could share with me their biggest takeaway from the day. It's really my favorite part because until I started doing this, I didn't realize what parts made an impact on people. But inevitably, somebody always says the line that I share in the seminar, which is 20 seconds of courage can alter your life. 20 seconds of courage. Because think about it. Fire service is, is for the most part, 364 and a half days of routine activity followed by 20 seconds of, you know, terror where you have to get beyond something. And if, and if you're that person that, hey, you don't, you don't ever encounter fear, well, good for you. Good for you. I'm happy for you. But see, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's the management of fear. I had written a whole book about this when I had put Common Value together. I didn't even realize I was writing about that 20 seconds of courage. But when I was sharing people's stories and they were talking to me about that moment when it was like I'm either going to push through this doubt and fear or throw in a towel, and what made them push through that doubt and fear and uncertainty to do the right thing, that moment is the moment that we're talking about when I talk about courage, as compared to throwing in the towel. You may be familiar with the thriller in Manila, Ali versus Frazier, one of the greatest fights in history, but leading up to the final round, these guys nearly beat each other to death. It was the 15th round. It was before it started. Ali gets to his corner. He turns to Dundee and says, cut my gloves. I'm done. Dundee says, no, stand up. He says, cut my gloves. I can't go anymore. I'm finished. Ali said it was the closest he's ever been to death. Dundee says, no, stand up. He makes his fighter stand up. And in the other corner, Eddie Futch throws in the towel, tells, tells Frazier, no more, you're done. You can watch this on YouTube. You can watch Frazier actually as exhausted as he was, arguing with Eddie Futch saying, I can go. I can go. Futch says, you're done. Ali won the fight because he stood, because his trainer made him stand. And that's the 20 seconds of courage we're talking about. But in today's world, we desperately need courageous leaders off the fire ground, not just on the fire ground. With all the challenges that we're dealing with, we need enough people out there to say enough's enough to the right people in a respectful, correct way. Courage is the power to let go of the familiar. You know, three types of courage are going to serve you well. Moral courage, which means to do the right thing. Physical courage, which is to function effectively when there's physical danger present. And courageous communication. And courageous communication is being willing to have the hard conversations that are often necessary to lead during difficult times. Any type of courage you have will draw critics. And this is Paul's version for this month. I will have the courage to stand up for what is right, just, and honorable, even if it makes me a target for your criticism. Everything good I have in life, it took me years of hard work. And every time I stepped away from familiarity to improve my situation, I was met with criticism. And i got to be honest, it used to bother me. It actually used to almost cripple me. But now I kind of thrive on it because I realize that, you know what, if you don't have critics in your life, you're not standing up for anything. I teach my boys this. You know, when you fight for something, when you stand up and say, I'm going to fight for something, there's always going to be someone who's standing between you and what you want. And if you ever lose your will to fight, someone with fight still in them will control your life. And this goes true in any aspect. Thomas Jefferson once said, one man with courage is a majority. We can change that to now one person with courage is a majority. And there's no shame in failure. The only shame, in my opinion, is when you don't try to achieve the life you want for your family, for yourself, for your team, because you thought the road was going to be too hard. Well, you know what? Embrace the struggles. Embrace, crit embrace the criticism. And congratulations, by the way, if you have critics, because that's just confirmation that you stood up for something. And my advice to you is this. Listen to them. I, want, I listen to what my critics say. I don't let them define me, though. Suggestions for improvement. Stand up for what you believe in and understand. Action cures fear. How about honorable? How about that as a trait? You know, by default, you are considered honorable the day you put on your uniform. The United States Fire Service has earned that. Have you? You know, my father, retired firefighter, my brother, deputy chief and a tour commander on a tour before mine. You know, they're, they're honorable. In my eyes, these are honorable men. 
They're honorable. They're truthful. They stand up for what they believe in is right. I'm working. I'm being as honorable as I can because it's always a work in progress. What are honorable leaders? People that lead by example, live a life of integrity. They don't start rumors. They accept responsibility. They take charge when no one else does. They remember where they came from. Don't steal, lie, or fight. Don't betray their brothers and sisters. And they do the right thing. Calvin Coolidge said, no person was ever honored for what they received. Honor is a reward for what they gave. What will your legacy be? I want to give you a couple of suggestions for improvement, and really it, they're suggestions from Norman Schwarzkopf because I had the, the honor of hearing him speak many years ago, and I do wish he was alive today. I do wish he was running for president because I love what this guy stood for. But many years ago he talked about 13 principles of leadership. It was the Atlanta, Georgia Dome, 20,000 people. I'm writing notes like crazy. He gets down to the final two, and he says, if you forget every other trait, you just remember these two. Remember these two, and you'll be okay. Take charge and always do the right thing. Take charge and always do what's right. And we talk about that a lot, DTRT, right? Do the right thing in the fire service. But are people just using it as Facebook statuses, or are they actually living it? When we talk about honor, I want, I want to leave you with this thought. And this would really be the, the main suggestion for improvement. Most of us in the fire service have a name on the back of our jacket and a name on our helmet. And the name on the back of your jacket is going to represent your family, and the name on the helmet is going to represent the organization you work for. Well, do yourself a favor and do everybody a favor and make them both proud. Leaders teach the acronym that makes up these traits we talked about really comes out to the last and the 13th trait itself, which is leaders teach what they know to other people. Think about this. If you possess, we have over about 14 or 1,500 people that have registered for this webcast, and we'll have thousands that listen to it the next few months recorded. If you have the combined knowledge of every single person that listens to this webcast, you still have a lot to learn about what we do for a living. Well, I don't take that comment lightly. I hope you don't either. We all have strengths. We all have weaknesses. We need to share our knowledge. We need to work really hard to develop layered leadership within our organization. Layered leadership basically means this. 99% of the leadership occurs not from the top, but from the middle of an organization. And it, it really benefits everybody to develop people throughout the organization. Why? Because the person you give advice to today may be the person you have to rely on to save your life tomorrow. Suggestions for improvement are easy. Learn something new every day and then pay it forward and use every single incident as a training opportunity. And I want to encourage you to do one thing I talk about a lot, and I've talked about it in the books, and I've talked about it a lot in person. Celebrate your victories. You know, don't just wait for, for big, great things to happen to celebrate. If you go out and as a crew, you just did a great job as an incident, come back, high-five each other, and celebrate that victory. You know, we talked about those 13 traits from loyalty down to leaders teachers being traits associated with success in the fire service. Well, here are some traits that are associated with leadership failure. And I'm just going to give you the list, but we're not going to talk much about them right now because the, we're at the end of the webcast. But one is lacks passion, two, unclear vision, poor communication skills, avoids taking risks, Callous, unethical, poor self-management, incompetent, plays the victim, tears others down, micromanages, first to take the credit and last to take the blame. And if you're like me, and hopefully you are like me, you'll know that you have some qualities on that left side, but you may have some on that right side. And remember that saying I said twice, and I'll say it again, you cannot fix what you refuse to acknowledge. Once we realize where we're failing, we can now take corrective actions to improve. Now, that sums up our webcast for today. And again, we spoke about leaders traits, and it's a short version of it. Um, you know, I'm sorry I had to cut out some videos and some of the stories, but uh, I hope you feel like you took value away from that. I want to again remind you, if you're looking for information on any of these other topics. Uh, you can find them at Step Up and Lead. You can find them uh, by going to fireengineering.com 
and, uh, and searching my name or searching some of those topics because I've written articles on many of those topics as well. Uh, I also want to say that, you know, I've been, I've been doing quite a bit of traveling. I want to thank my family, by the way. I don't do this enough. I do at the seminars. I don't do this enough in a, in a venue like this. But my wife is the absolute best in the world to allow me to follow my dream and my passion to go out and do what I'm doing. Um, you know, but, you know, I have a lot of seminars about probably about 10 or 12, maybe 15, actually 16 coming up for the rest of this year that are open to the public. Many of them are not open. Um, I'm easy to find if you go on Facebook and you go to Step Up and Lead, the um, the book page, which is really the uh, the fan page of Step Up and Lead. There's about 20,000 members. Look on that. You'll see a list of the seminars coming up. You could shoot me an inbox or even leave me a message directly underneath, and I'll let you know the contact information if you're interested in attending the live event, and I would encourage you to do it. Um, but, I, but what I want to say before I open this up to questions is this. I, I want to send out a sincere thank you to everybody at Fire Engineering and everybody at Penwell. Uh, I'm really proud to be part of the family. I'm really happy that, that Peter and Bobby um, put enough faith in me to invite me onto a webcast like this to share uh, some, some thoughts that I find to be valuable. And um, because when you're asked to do a presentation on a forum like this, it's not only a great honor. You know what? It's a tremendous responsibility, and it's something I don't take lightly. So I want to thank them for putting their faith in me with that. But I also want to thank each and every one of you for taking an hour out of your life to take some time and listen to this webcast. I really hope you found the opportunity to, uh, to take some notes. If not, again, it's going to be recorded, and you can take another look, and you can pause it where you need to and get the information you need to out of this. And feel free to contact me anytime. So uh, I look forward to connecting with everybody. Peter, I'm going to turn it back to you right now. I believe we're going to open it up to questions. But thank you, everybody who listened in. Have a great day. Yeah, wow, well, Frank, uh, that was a, an amazing presentation. It was uh, just chock full of information. And I know it's hard to whittle a lot of this stuff down, uh, you know, to a, a webcast size uh, bite. But um, we, we really appreciate you coming on here and, and just uh, – Giving us all, all, all this, all that you have to offer here. Um, but we got a number of questions. Um, you know, if if you want to send in a question, look for that uh, ask a question box. Uh, and before we start with the questions, I just wanted to thank once again the University of Wisconsin and Oshkosh for sponsoring this. And uh, you know, they they brought you this uh, training, so really uh, really grateful to them. So please check them out at online. To, dot u w o s h dot e d u slash f e r m and um so we got some questions here um and frank if we don't get to all of them if we can could we send them to you and we maybe you could respond to them individually and we could post some of those answers on the f e website if that's cool yeah yeah i'd be honored to i don't know how much we probably have a good 15 or 20 minutes i don't know how much time you have but in about 15 or 20 minutes my door is going to open three Maniac kids are going to be running in here. They're going to take <laughs> over the place. So I'll be happy to no talk problem. to you as long as I can. Sure, and they're they're coming in uh, fast and furious now. So we'll start off with one uh, from Jim Moss. Uh, he's, he says, being a new company officer has a similar feel to being a new probationary firefighter. You're told, uh, don't try to change the world and don't rock the boat. So how can a new new company officers build trust and inspire positive change at the company level? Jim, and I'm familiar with you, Jim. I actually have in my office at work, in the deputy's office, I have uh, some leadership uh, rules that you posted on Firefighter Toolbox hanging up. And so uh, I thank you for that. Um, which means, think about this, you're already influencing people. You've influenced me. Uh, influence is a funny thing. See, anytime your mouth moves, you're influencing somebody. Anytime you got somebody's attention, you're influencing them. So what comes out of your mouth, the things you do, the things you say, they all matter. And that's why it's so – and listen, it matters what you say and do on social media too. When I see a leader that I, or a person that I consider to be a strong leader in the fire service post on Facebook, I'm so frustrated I can't stand this organization or something like that, I cringe. I say, you may feel that way, but that's when you need to talk to somebody else. My advice is this. The number one question I receive is, that's very much in line with what Jim just asked is – and this is – you know, by far, number one, people say I'm a newly appointed officer. I want to make positive change in my organization, but I'm encountering resistance. How do I do it? And my answer 
is simple. Don't try to change your entire organization right now. Focus on changing one. What I mean by that is, is you know, there's power in your ability to influence somebody to understand that not only do you need change within your organization, but they say, you know what, I'm in. I want to make change too. I don't, they don't have to agree with everything you want to do, by the way, or how you want to do it, but they're in. They want to progress the organization. They want to become better as a team. Because the power of two is now you can influence other people. And there's something about the number five that, that I have found to be magical because I've had success outside the fire service with large organizations. And any time I've had an organization, whether it be 20 or 1,700, I always led with five key people. I call them my culture creators. If you can get five key people to say, hey, you know what? I'm with you, Jim. I want to make change, too. Why don't we consider doing this and come up with a plan and start implementing things? It's funny. You get to that point to where people are going to think not only is it cool to join you, but, it's, but they're going to feel left out if they don't at some point because five, is just seems, to be, five seems to be a number that can run an organization of any size. And, again, I can't explain it, but I'll sum it up by putting it to you this way. Wouldn't it be nice in our country if we can go back to a time when we had five leaders in the White House that agreed on anything? We don't even have – I mean, five people can run a country. So they could certainly run organizations of several hundred. So stay on the right path. Uh, start doing the things we talked about in this webcast, you know, because they're going to start uh, helping you with your influence. But understand that any time you do anything – uh, anytime you speak, anytime you have somebody's attention, you are influencing them. So use that power wisely. Pete? Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump to another one that is uh, about LODDs. This one asks, how, how can you motivate your department after having an LODD without using the LODD, uh, you know, specifically? Is there a way to, 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 to convey that or what? If, if a department is not motivated after having an LODD, that's a bigger problem than, uh, than you can imagine because, I mean, certainly one of the biggest problems that I see in organizations, not just the fire service but outside, but, it, but it's specifically in the fire service certainly, is we're very reactive instead of proactive. And, you know, the motivation has to be there for, for the right reasons. People have to be reminded what they do why they do it, how to do it better. And you got people like, like uh, Goldfeder putting great information out there, um, you know, on, on not just near misses. He talks about line of duty deaths. He talks about the near misses, you know, the secret list and things like that where you can start to gather information, sit down and talk about things. You know, we, we've had two line of duty uh, deaths, but it was before I got on the job. So, and, you know, God willing, we won't have one uh, again. But I know that we've never really looked back and, and used them uh, to try to motivate people. You know, we, we had a, a couple that were related to heart attacks. But we never uh, looked back and tried to get them to motivate people. Um, so I, I really don't know if I'm the right person to speak on how to do it if it's a recent line of duty death you had. But all I can say is, is you know, if people are having a hard time getting motivated to be better after a tragedy like that happens – Man, I don't really know what to say. I don't know really what to say because there's a time and a place for uh, for people to understand it's time that we need to step up and get better and do things right. And if, if that's not a telltale sound, I don't know what is. Pete? Okay. So we got uh, one from Joe Maggiore who's, who asks, um, what is one trait that you've seen in your experience that has derailed a good leader? If there can be one, I guess, but... Um, you know, that's a real good question, too. And I think we still have the slides up. So I'll go back, and if I can show you this list one more time, I want to – oh, I just went past it for a second. I want to tell you that some of the um, – one of the worst things that I've seen is the uh, micromanaging. I've seen when people micromanage, they fail to develop their team. And I think that's a big problem. Sorry, it took me a, a lot longer to get to this. Now, that's number 11 on the list. And I think that if you are a micromanager on this call, I just want to talk to you really quick about 
ways that you don't have to be or ways to get over it. Because what I realized when I was thinking about micromanagers and studying about them and trying to figure out, uh, you know, what causes it, I realized there's parts of my life and part of me as a leader that does micromanage certain things. Well, the way you get over micromanaging is to, number one, is three steps. One, manage outcomes, not the process. So instead of managing how people do things, if you ask them to tie a knot and they tie the knot and they give it back to you, be happy you got the knot. Worst thing you do is say, yeah, that's good, but I don't like the way you tied it. I want you to tie it my way. You know, because all that's going to do is, is create a problem. Uh, the second thing is let people run in their lanes. It's not just about you getting all the credit. We've covered that pretty thoroughly. It's about giving other people the credit because they're going to feel like they're a better part of the team. And the next thing is delegate, but delegate with the intentions of developing your team. So I think, you know, between micromanaging, there is a way to overcome that. Again, you, you can't fix what you refuse to acknowledge. So hopefully that helps you. But I'll also say that, you know, there is a um, – the number one cause of low morale in the workplace, according to a poll from, from uh, quite a few years ago, was drag, having to drag around dead weight, otherwise known as lazy coworkers that no one will discipline. We have this, um, this CEO about a year ago that made national news because he took a major pay cut and brought all his salaries up to $70,000 incomes, gave everybody a raise, and everybody was praising him for doing a great job. To me, it sounds a lot like, like what they do with my kids when they give everybody a trophy just for participating. Well, you know what happened to his business? I want to tell you what happened to his business. Two of his top employees, the two top employees, quit. They quit the job and went to try to find work elsewhere. You know why? Because they felt it was unfair that people that just punched the clock were getting the same pay that they were getting and were getting a significant raise when they were working so much harder. So, you know, w one of the things we need to do is identify and reward the people that work harder. So I'm not saying give them more money. It's, that's not what we do here in the fire service. But certainly it's by pointing out the good, understanding the good. And when somebody's not stepping up and somebody's not doing the things that they need to do, we have to bring attention to that, you know, not to everybody but to that person and do what we need to do to, to, to make them better. So that list right there of those leadership failure, those traits associated with leadership failure, I say are the top 13 to answer your question. I personally would put micromanaging or micromanagers uh, up at the top of the, of the list for the question you just asked. Pete? All right. Well, Frank, uh, th those are great answers. And for, for other people who are looking to go back and, and ask uh, details, don't forget that this will be available as an archive uh, very shortly, so you're able to go back and go through at your own pace um, to pick up on any of the details that we you might have missed. But um, we have a couple other questions, but Frank, if we can, I think we'll wrap it up, and if you, we'll send them to you, and if you can answer them, we'll put them on the fire engineering site. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely take care of that as soon as I get the questions. As soon as I have time, I'll sit down, write some answers up, and send them back to you, Pete. Okay. Well, uh, we, we really appreciate it again, Frank, uh, and thanks to everyone who uh, – you know, took the time to, to participate. And uh, we'd also like to thank once again our sponsor, the University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh. And so um, th this uh, presentation will be archived within 24 hours, and you'll be able to access it from our homepage at fireengineering.com. And we're going to send a reminder, reminder email message to everyone who registered, complete with a direct link to the archive. So thanks uh, for joining us today for Step Up and Lead, and we look forward to serving you with future webcasts.